far as the, the actual effects on everybody. But the main thing I want to focus on with you today uh, as a pastor and, and as, as it's applicable right here to what we're dealing with is that leaders or pastors or leaders of a family or whoever you are, a father that, that takes the headship, a mother also that's guiding the home in that sense, must deal with sin. We must deal with sin. Leaders must deal with sin. It is very important that, that we have a right understanding of dealing with sin. And we see some good principles here in Joshua chapter 7 that give us the understanding. Uh, for instance, it applies to husbands in dealing with wives and, you know, and wives and how they deal with their husbands in that sense. But dealing with sin... And, and having a proper understanding of it, uh, it, of the principles that are here, I think, and we'll put some perspective on it here. Joshua 7, verse number 1, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now I want you to go down to verse number 11. Because verse number 11 is... Uh, it really explains it, and we're, we are, believe it or not, doesn't look like it, but we're moving forward in this chapter. It's just there's a few little things, uh, a few big things that, that, that we need to deal with, that we need to understand. Verse 11, Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen, and disassembled, and dissembled, also, and they have dissembled and they have put it even among their own stuff. So they compromised their, their sanctification by doing that. They compromised Israel's sanctification by doing that. Understand that. We'll talk more about that really next week. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies. Sin in the believer's life will always bring cowardice. It will always bring a spirit of cowardice to them. If you have sin in your life, if you have ongoing sin in your life that you're living in as a believer, it, you will become cowardice. This is not to be confused with uh, those that are by nature more feeble in themselves and they're not bold in that. I'm not speaking of that. I'm not saying not every believer is going to be the same. Some so the Bible says to comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak. Not all men are going to be as bold as others. You're going to have men in your assembly, and some of them are going to be, as a church, I realize there are some that are, that are really forward-speaking, they're loud, they're, they're boisterous, they're, but actually some of those are actually feeble-minded. They think they're tough, but they're really not. Amen. Because when you actually get down to it and you deal with them, I, I understand that they, though they can speak the loudest, it doesn't mean they're the toughest. Sometimes it's the person that's the quietest, that's not very bold, but they're able to, to withstand a lot of things, right? Yep. That, that the one with the bull-hearted and the loud mouth maybe, maybe isn't able to. Or God tries their boldness, right? Uh, so there's, there, don't, don't be mistaken by that. Uh, th there's a difference in, in just being very loud and actually having the, the spiritual intestinal fortitude to back it up, which only comes through trials, by the way. It doesn't come any other way. You don't grow in grace until grace is tried. You don't, you don't, you don't grow like that to maturity until you're tried. It's just, it's the only way. There is no shortcut. There is no other way. That's the way God has it, for a purpose and a reason. That way no man can exalt himself. Right? Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies. Because they were accursed, neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed from among you. Those words, when we think about them, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, pray, we pray you'd be with us now, Lord, and we pray you'd help us. Speak to our hearts. Spirit of God, convict the lost. Bring them to repentance and faith in Christ. Strengthen the saved today. Edify your saints, we pray. In Jesus' holy name, amen. You know, those words, they ring in our ears. Israel has sin. Think about those words. How we've heard those words from the Holy Spirit against us as well as a New Testament church, right? 
we think about those words, Israel has sinned. You know, we're not confused about them being the Old Testament Israel and us being the New Testament church, right? We understand that. But neither do we ignore the great teaching that was given to us about those words. And they ring in our ears as well in Romans 15, 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. We through patience and comfort of the scriptures. And also in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now all these things happen unto them for ensembles and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Amen. These are the warnings that they're written for us. So all of those things in the Old Testament are principles and things that are written for our admonition, for our learning, for our instruction, for our understanding, that we might not lust after evil things, that, we, that our hearts may not follow those things of the world, right? So Achan's lesson right here is our lesson today. Joshua chapter 7 is our lesson today. And it applies to us, and may God's Spirit help us to apply it correctly and rightly today to, to our hearts that we would understand it. I think the first thing that the Lord brought to my attention that sticks out here is, number one, we should remember that God still hates sin. I, I don't think you ought to ever lose sight of that. Before we truly open up this portion of Scripture, we should make one sure and important comparison between us and them. And that is that we have the same God. God is holy. His nature is inherently holy. And there is no evil or sin in him. All that flows from God. Understand this very thing. God taught me this very young on in my Christian life. When I was newly saved, I cut my teeth, my spiritual teeth on men like Spurgeon and A.W. Pink and, 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 and Sharnock and men like that that drove home the holy nature of God. They drove home this, this truth and the attributes of God. A.W. Pink talks about this. And he, he, he taught other men, Sharnock, who he got really from Sharnock, by the way. A lot of what he got was from him. Anyway, you won't understand what I'm saying, but one was written 300 years before the other, just so you know. Um, <laughs> Sharnock was, yeah. And Sharnock wrote a lot about the attributes of God. And what he talked about was the holiness of God, and he went through the scriptures. And what he, what he showed very emphatically for you, for you and I to understand is that all of God's attributes, everything of who God is that comes out of God flows from his holiness. He is first the king of righteousness. I remember uh, listening to a sermon Spurgeon preached on this, and I listened to it years ago when I was newly saved. And the one thing that that sermon drove home, he is first the king of righteousness, and then he is the king of peace. Right? All righteousness flows from God. Every attribute of God, whether it's his love, his mercy, his long suffering, his patience, all of those things, every single one of those attributes of God, every single one. So people say God is love, they are correct, but he is first holy, and that's how he can love you. Amen. Because he's holy, right? Because, see, he loves you with a per. God says, I love you with a perfect love. Amen. What does that mean? That means that his perfection comes from his holiness. Do you understand that? God is perfect, yes, because he's holy. Everything that God does, everything, God is inherently holy. That's what you have to understand. Now, there, that's good to understand. Why is that good to understand? That means that it, whatever comes my way, I know that God is just. God is right. Why? Because God is holy. So I can trust him because every decision that he makes, everything that he's allowed to befall upon me, everything is holy from God. Everything stems from his holiness. So he can never be wrong because he's holy. Right? God is eternal, right? 
But his eternalness flows from his holiness because he is holy. He has no beginning of days. He has no end of days because he is holy. You see, you and I, you and I can be holy through the holiness of God. It's imparted, that righteousness is imparted to us. But God never had anyone impart any righteousness to him because he is holy. He is inherently holy. That's the difference. So when Jesus walked on this earth because he is God in the flesh, he is inherently holy. Understand that. Everything about you. Now, what's the difference in that and you? Everything in you and I is inherently, in our flesh, is inherently sinful. That's the difference. Everything in you and I is inherently sinful. We should not expect our flesh to do good. We should expect it to do evil, and we should walk in the Spirit. Right? We should expect, like, the longer you're saved and the more you realize, and, and when, you, when you have some humbling things happen to you in your life and in your heart, the longer you're saved and God humbles you and teaches you, man, you're not surprised at how wicked this flesh is. You're surprised it hasn't turned into a monster and completely consumed you and ate you. And it would if it wasn't for the grace of God. It would. Because there are two opposites there. God is inherently holy, and you and I, by the fall of man, are inherently sinful. And we need the grace of God. Right? I, I talked about that on thir uh, Friday on my broadcast. Seven times in the King James Bible, the word weakness is there. And it all applies to us, by the way. <laughs> weakness. Seven times the word virtue is in the Bible, and it all applies to God. It all applies to Christ. And that word virtue is used uniquely many times concerning Christ. Now, I want you to think about this. That, that is perfection, that number seven, right? So you and I are perfectly weak. Christ is perfectly virtuous and perfectly strong. Amen. Now, get this, though. It gets even better. It gets gooder. Watch this. Because those two things met in the person of Christ. Because, see, he took on sinful flesh. He became a man, right? So he took on your weakness so he could give you his virtue. Amen, right. Think about that. Because you needed it. So you were completely weak, and he is completely virtuous, and you need that holy energy, that moral, holy energy from God. Amen. And you get it in Christ Jesus. Amen. And that's how you're accepted in the beloved. Right? In Christ in the person of Christ. Amen. You need to fall in love with Jesus today. That's the dire need. God is holy. His nature is inherently holy. Because of his holiness, he absolutely hates sin. He hates to see sin in his children. He will not wink at their sin. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, forever. He does not change. He is the immutable God. God hates sin. And he will not allow it to reign in his children's hearts or his church. When sin was in the camp in Israel, he put it down, he revealed it, and he outed it. That's what he does. It's not different in his church either. I remember years ago, our church went through many tumultuous times, and God used the preaching of his word to reveal sin in the lives of those that are no longer with us. He revealed those to those young ones that came to us that never were saved, and some of them are here, and you're here today. And you were born again by the Spirit of God, right? Saved by the grace of God, walking in the fear of the Lord now, right? Why? Because God reveals that. He revealed it. That's what God does in his church. He reveals that self-righteousness. He reveals those things. He brings us to that place. And God preserved this church through everything. God preserved everyone in this room through all these trials, <laughs> through all these things, right? Right? And it wasn't without a few whoopings along the way either. <laughs> Amen. Hey, I'll admit it, man. I'm one of those guys that those Puritans talked about. Man, some people, God has to whip them all. Or Spurgeon said that. Some people, God's got to whip them all the way to heaven. That's me. Right? That's me. Lest you and I think that we got there on our own merits somehow. Lest we forget what God did for us, right? That you forgot, you, you've forgotten you were purged of your old sins, right? Amen. Come on, that self-reliance, God will work it out of you. God hates sin. 
But many that were not true to the Lord and were full of secret sins and things of that nature while they preached the gospel to others, and I don't mean secret faults because we all have secret faults. We all have things that we have to battle and that, that, that we face. I'm not talking about that. Or faults that, that we deal with. But outright trickery, abuse, fakery, sinful activity that was going on, God weeded it out. God wouldn't tolerate it at his church. If you're here today and you believe that you can live in some secret abominable sin, you're wrong. God will never let it happen. He doesn't. God doesn't let us live like that. Right? God will not allow it to go on forever. He uses preaching and he uses trials to weed it out of us. That's what he does to us. Many who did not want to get right with God, they wouldn't hold up to any accountability. They had cloaks that could not cover. Right? Interesting, isn't it? But God took care of it. You know, others I've seen, and it's sad, they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year starting websites and doing all kinds of stuff, trash, talking dirty, talking filthy, making money off of the world, and mocking and laughing it, laughing and, and, and dropping F-bombs like crazy, and this is their testimony. This is what they, they are, right? This is where they went from, right? God doesn't tolerate that. Even their wives supporting their wicked their wickedness and bragging on them. But God weeds it out of his church. What's not to be there? For the simple reason that God is holy. God corrects all of us because God is holy. Amen. First Peter chapter 1, verse number 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Three times in the King James Bible, one for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost, right? Be ye holy, three times. Is that an accident? No, that was on purpose. God did that, right? God did that. Always remember that, that God is holy. You say, well, God will not deal with us as he did with Achan. You're right. In a sense, that's true. But may I remind you of the reason that you will not burn alive and you will not be stoned with stones? Because he already did it to his son. Amen. Our Lord and Savior suffered it already for me. Amen. So how can I hold hands with sin that slew my Savior? That brought the wrath of God down upon him without any mercy. Shall I coddle sin tonight, today? Shall I do that today? Shall I harbor up sin in my heart? Shall I hold sin in my heart and hold hands with it and become affectionate with sin? <coughs> Shall I betray my Lord, play the Judas, love what God hates? Or should I deny my Lord and his sacrifice by living in sin? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid that Jesus should suffer for me and that I should, and that I should go about and live in sin, that I should hold on to that sin, that I should love that sin. Right? Amen. Oh, I should repent of that sin. I should hate that sin. And not because I'm going to burn into everlasting fire. Because I'm not going to! Amen. There is a difference in being grateful. How is it that men, I will tell you this, if you, if you tell me, if you show me a man that lives like that and that thinks like that, I don't mean that falls into sin. I'm talking about one that lives like that, thinks like that, and is okay with that. I'll show you, and they're proud of it, I'll show you a man that doesn't know the grace of God. Right? When you brag about what you can get away with as a Christian, that's not a Christian. That's a lost person. That's not a saved person. Why? Because saved people don't do that. Why? Because saved people remember what Jesus did for them. And their hearts are broken over their sin. And they hate it. They hate it when they fail God. They hate it when they sin against God. It grieves their hearts. Right? Let us put away the accursed thing from among us. Let us remember our God is the same, that he is holy, and he will not change. 
and that Christ suffered for my sins. And let me never take advantage of that or use Christ as some cheap credit card to charge up anything my heart desires to do because I have forgiveness already paid for. That would be to pervert the gospel. And if you can do that and live in peace with yourself, then I dare say you're not his child. And you should examine yourself whether you be in the faith. No, you're not, lest you be reprobate. A professing Christian that does not shudder at the thought of sinning against his Lord and is never grieved by it may just be that, a professor and not a possessor. We can get sideways and we can get wrong for a while. We sure can. But the grace of God brings us back and God chastens his own children and, he, and, he, and they're not happy in their sin. They don't live, they're not having a heyday in their sin and they're not enjoying it. Sin is only pleasurable for a season, but that season passes for the Christian extremely quickly. And then he realizes what he's done to his Lord and he realizes how he's sinned against God's grace and his mercy. You see, children, your upbringing, what God has done for you today, that is a gift. It is the gift of his dear son and you ought not ever, ever trample that. You ought to walk in fear. And I'm not trying to unsaint the true saint here today, but call them to live by that holy name they were saved by. And to remember, be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Number two, Joshua's dealing with the sin. Let me tell you, honestly, leaders do not like to deal with sin. Pastors do not. It's, I, it's not fun. When you have to go tell people, when you have to, like Nathan, when he went to David, that was not a fun thing. Like Nathan, I, I can guarantee you just by the examples of scripture, like Nathan wasn't looking forward to that. Oh man, I get to go tell David, the king. I get to go, the man after God's own heart, right? One, I got to go stand in his presence and I got to go tell him, David, you're the man and you are in trouble, right? That's not easy to do. It's, it's not easy. It's not easy for pastors to do when they have to go to people and they have to talk to people. It's like the, mo it's like the most unenjoyable thing you can possibly do to go, to go deal with a situation that needs to be dealt with and to help people. It's not fun. It's not meant to be fun either, right? It's meant to be very sobering and that you watch for your own self. That's the pastor's self-watch. Spurgeon wrote that. That's the first chapter in his book on... Um, lectures to my students right here is the minister's self-watch take heed to thyself right he talks about making sure you're converted making sure you've been born again by the spirit of god that you have the evidences of the holy ghost working in your heart and life amen and then also to watch thyself be careful to watch thyself right because satan wants to trip you up the pastor if he can get the pastor tripped up he can really you know smite the shepherd so the sheep will scatter that's what he wants to do. That's why you, it's incumbent upon you that you pray for me daily. Amen. By the way, if you don't do it for me, do it for yourself. Yep. <laughs> do it for yourself. Right? You'll notice, though, that, that Joshua, that even in such a terrible setting of, a man, of men dying, the loss of the battle, Joshua is still very careful how he deals with the sin. Joshua had to rely on wisdom from the Lord and how to deal with that sin. Verse number 14 in the text, if you'll look there, please. In the morning, therefore, God gives him instructions. He says, in the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the households which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. All I can say when I read that is thank God for grace. Yeah. <laughs> that's, all I, that's all I, thank God for grace, right? Thank God for what Jesus did on the cross for sinners, amen? Thank God. Thank God for what he did for us. Thank God he paid that penalty for my sin. So God makes known who sinned, and Joshua carefully followed the instructions of the Lord. You know, that whooping they took at Ai was due to sin. But also, Joshua made the mistake of following men's advice. Instead of them going to report, Joshua seeking the Lord's face, 
Joshua made the mistake of being presumptuous and listening to the soldier's direction and advice. Again, let me say this to you. No matter how well-meaning men are, the man of God, the pastor, has to get alone with God and get answers from God. I, it's my duty. I have to. And God showed me that uh, again, renewed that in me four years ago when I was swayed by things. God renewed that in me. And he showed me, when I'm done with you, son, the only face you're going to look for is mine. The only thing you're going to want is my power. The only desire you're going to have is to sit at my feet and to learn of me. You will desire it and sit at his feet I did and desire it I did with much tears, with much weeping, and God gave it to me. And he gave me back that fire and that zeal and that power from above because he taught me to search after Christ with all my heart and continue to follow him wherever he may be. Through the dark, follow me through that dark valley. And he took me through that, that valley of the shadow of death, the darkest time, and he said, go. Go through it. Keep going. God, I don't know what you want me to do. I want you to trust me. That's what I want you to do. But God, every fiber in my being and everything that I have in this flesh wants to fear, wants to be afraid, wants to melt my brain down into nothing. I have zero confidence, Lord. I have nothing like that. I, I feel so destitute. And he said, but you have me and search for me and you'll find me. I'll come to you. I'll be with you in the dark. I'll sit right down in the dark with you. I'll be right next to you. I will comfort. I will hold your hand. If you'll seek my face, I'll hold your hand. I will not let you you go I will not let you go and I'll put a floor to your misery I'll put a floor to your desolation I'll put a floor to your depression and I'll tell it go no farther stop there and go no farther I remember the night that God did it I remember I went into a panic attack one night and I was having it hard and I sat there after a conversation I had with somebody and I sat there in that bed and I said oh God I feel like I'm gonna sink I feel like I'm done, like I got nothing left, like I, I, I'm, I'm in such desperation and my mind feels like it's going to be gone. And God said, okay, that's right where I wanted you. I'll pull you up. I'll put a floor to it. I won't let it go any farther. See, God taught me, you get alone with me and you don't, you know what, you don't worry about what anybody else thinks. You get alone with me. You follow my word, and you set your face as a flint, and you follow me. I don't care who in your church doesn't like it. You follow me. You get alone with me. You bury your face in my book. You bury your face into me. That's what he did. So then God made known that Joshua carefully followed those instructions of the Lord. He sought God's face. See, he made a mistake in this part of not doing that. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So there went up thither of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men. For they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore, the hearts of the people melted and became as water. See, Joshua follows in humility now, though, in verse 16. After he took that whoop and after he found out there was sin in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in verse number 16 in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes. And the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah. And he took the family of the Zarhites. And he brought the family of the Zarhites man by man. And Zabdi was taken. And he brought his household man by man. See, God knows how to find his man, by the way. He knows how to, God knows how to find it. He knows how to direct it, too. I'll tell you what, man. There's been things that's happened in this church that I could never figure out. I could never make happen in a million years. I could never zero in on anything like that. And God goes, I will. And zeroes right in on it. See, I don't have to. He's God. He'll do it. You just got to trust in him. He'll take care of it. He always does. That's why some people get a little nervous 
sometimes when things happen or outside things. And I just look at them now because of what the Lord brought me through. And I say, I ain't afraid of any of these people. Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of any of them. I don't care what they do. Like, I don't, yeah, I, I'm not afraid of it. Why? Because I've had God take me through the meat grinder. I've had him take me through that. And I've seen things in my brain that are scarier than any man could show me on this earth. People tell me, oh, I'll tell you about these, these conspiracy theories and you'll be spooked and scared. No, I won't. I've seen worse things like that in my brain, man, in the middle of the night at 2 o'clock in the morning crying out to God for relief. So that don't scare me. Amen. And people telling me they're going to do this or they're going to do that or this is going to happen or that's going to happen. Yeah, right. Okay, whatever. God, t God then took me through the tornado, through the fire, through everything you could imagine. And he preserved me and kept me. Amen. Whatever. What are you going to do to me? What, take my body? My soul's going to heaven. I get a promotion. I'm going early. and you got to suffer here. Amen. I'm out of here. Amen. That's just, that's just, that's the next place. That's the promotion. That's the next one up. There ain't a bigger church that's a promotion for me. Amen. No, there's heaven that's a promotion. Amen. That's, that when I, you guys talk about getting promoted. Well, don't talk about my promotion too quickly. <laughs> like, when I get promoted, I'm gone. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> right. I'm out of here. I'm, I'm going home. But that's okay too if that's what God wants. But. But <laughs> I'd like to be here a little longer. Get some more done before I go. Amen. Amen. You know, God took them, God took Joshua and he showed him what he did wrong. He started to show him what was going on. There was sin. And then Joshua also became presumptuous with allowing these men to lead him and not getting along with God. He does it again, by the way, with the ambassadors yeah. later. So what does that tell you? Well, I don't know what it tells you but I know what it tells me. And that's that I have to guard myself against listening to other people and not hearkening unto the voice of the Lord. Amen. I gotta be careful about that. Because one thing you start to learn in the ministry is that men will always want to influence you. They will always want to, always. Good meaning men, but they will still want, and some bad meaning ones, Whew, boy do I know. And, and they will want to influence you. Mm-hmm. But you know what? Joshua was truly repentant at this point. 2 Corinthians 7.11 says this, For behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you! I'll tell you what, after the Lord brought me through many things like that, what carefulness it wrought in me. Mm -hmm. Yea, what clearing of yourselves! Yea, what indignation! Yea, what fear! Yea, what vehement desire! Yea, what zeal! Yea, what revenge! In all things, you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. See, that's true repentance. In all things, right, you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. When you've truly repented of sin, the sin that, that, that you're dealing with, when, when that true repentance has come, you do everything to be clear of that matter. You have a revenge against it. You have a carefulness. You sorrow after a godly sort. You stay away from it. You don't flirt with it. You don't, you don't play on the edge of it. You want to be as far away from it as you possibly can. You don't, you don't, no one's got to ask you, well, I wonder if I could get away with doing this. Or you don't have to ask that, right? No. You don't want to be anywhere near it. You don't want to, you don't want to harbor. When those thoughts start coming into your brain, you don't want, you know what? You know how you know you've not, you've followed the, the command and the spirit of the command. You want to know how you follow the spirit of the command? Is when you're not trying to get close to what, what God commands you to stay away from. You're not even, that, that's the spirit of it. See, your parents know that, that, that when a little kid, and you're like, don't touch that, and they go like this. How many had a little kid that went like this? And then they actually touch it. Well, actually, or they overstep their confidence, and they do, right? They get too close to it. But actually, parents, they ought to already be punished for doing that. Because they've disobeyed the spirit of your command. I mean, they're, they're literally telling you, I don't respect what you're saying, and, and I'm going to see how close I can get to it, right? That's, that's what, do you see what I mean? That's what they're doing. It's already in their heart. It's, it's already there. When there's true repentance, you stay as far away from that. If it was that phone like that, you'd say as far away from that as you can. You ain't going to flirt with it. Nope. God showed me, nope, I'm done with that. 
I ain't getting near that. See the difference? Listen, pastors, fathers, mothers must deal with sin. Sin is a nasty effect. We must deal with our own sin first. Then we must deal with it when we see it in our children. If you see a perverse way beginning in your children, you better deal with it right away. Don't let that perverse way fester. Don't let it get bigger. Don't let it grow. Don't let that rebellion, don't think that rebellion is cute. And that disobedience is cute to laugh at. It's not. You got to deal with it. You got to deal with it. Don't let it grow. Young people, God has impressed it upon my heart this week, especially on more than one occasion, just in my own family and in thinking of you, some of you. There is one thing. I mean, there's many things that can get us, but there's one thing that God really had me zero in on the thought of today uh, is self-will. You know, young people are to be under governors and tutors for a time, right? But many, but all of us as young people, we have in us well up that pride and that desire for self-will, to, to follow our own will to do our own thing, right? So, it, 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 by the way, let me tell you how that manifests. Are you listening, young people? I hope you are. I hope you're listening. You old people can listen too. But, but li listen to this. Self-will. It, it manifests itself in, in how you speak to your parents when they give you commands of the thought processes that you, that you have after your given instructions, how well you receive those instructions, what you do with those instructions when you're given them, and how close you follow the spirit of that command, and how, how close you just follow that command, and when nobody's looking, you do what you want anyway. That, that self-will that manifests itself in your choices that you learn to make, okay, or that you're supposed to make in time. That submission to authority, that submission to those that have more wisdom than you do in decisions and in things that you want to do in your life, in the future. That self-will is what will, if, it, if you're not careful, that will consume you. What you want and your passions and your desires, if they are not what God wants for you, they will consume you. They will take you and they will take you farther than you ever thought you had ever been in your life, you'd ever go in your life. I see many young men and young women with that self-will. They believe they have things figured out. They're not sure, though, exactly what they believe about things. In the girls and young ladies, I'm concerned with it that you're careful that you don't have a sassy or a rebellious spirit that can form in you. Sometimes it can come in the form of, of humor. But it's still very real. I remember um, uh, a couple years ago when I was uh, at another church, and uh, I, I remember them telling their daughter was real quiet, kind of quiet person. She grew up into her teen years, and she became really like outgoing and really kind of you know kind of sassy and kind of smart mouthed and and things like that, right? And, I mean, they, they thought it was cute that she came out of her shell, they said, kind of. You know what I mean? Like, they thought it was like a coming out of her shell, like she wasn't, like, too shy anymore. And that's a problem, by the way. You, you sh ladies, you shouldn't lose your shyness. There ought, to, there ought to be some shyness and some shamefacedness there. You ought, not, you ought not feel comfortable letting loose in front of everybody. Let me just tell you that. You should not, ladies. None of you ladies should feel, feel comfortable in, like, letting loose in front of everybody. I hope you understand what I mean by that. It's just, you, you, there ought to be some reserve. Ladies, you ought to always have some reserve about you. Always. Around other people. There's going to be a time when you're at home, when it's different, you know, and you're relaxed around mom and dad and family and husband and wife, that kind of thing. You're going to be a little more relaxed. But there's always kind of a, a little bit of a reserve that needs to be around. Other ladies need to have. Men have to have it too, but... Ladies, the Bible speaks of their being discreet, 
they're being chaste, they're being careful, right? So that, that goes into a lot of things. But this young girl, they thought it was good, and this young girl ended up running, running out, and I'm pretty sure did some pretty bad things. Now, I think that sometimes we don't watch our children enough. And I don't mean that we don't have them home. Children, listen to me. I, I understand that you're homeschooled uh, and that, you're, you know, that, that you go to church and your parents are very good at governing and regulating what you do and things of that nature. There's going to come a time, though, when that's not going to be there. And the true test of what you believe will be seen then. It's seen when you have some liberty. Now, if your liberty is used for a cloak of maliciousness, then you missed what we preached to you. You missed something along the way of how we raised you. If it's used to glorify God and to live a good life for the Lord and to be clean and to be faithful and to be virtuous and pure and walk in holiness and raise a family for God and live for the Lord, but if it's just that I'm only under these rules and then the time's going to click when, when, when I'm this certain age and then I, can, then I can fly like a bat out of hell. And I mean that very specifically. I'm just, I, I'm giving that very, time will tell whether what, what has happened in your heart and your soul is real or not. Right? It, it will tell. Right? And you might. You might live the, you might have some sadness and you might be a prodigal and you might come back, right? Or you may never come back. But either way, there's going to be a cost to it if you do it. There will be a cost if you become a prodigal and you walk away. There will be a cost to that. It will be a high cost. And you will suffer that in your mind for the rest of your life. I promise you, you will. It just, it's the way it is. You'll, you'll do it. You'll suffer it. You'll never get over that because you had... Much was given to you, and much is required of you. You were meted out much grace, right? And much is required of you. You know, so I, I would say be very careful about that, that sin that wells up in our children. We have to be careful. And young men have to be careful that they don't have a disregard for direction and authority. Not to listen to father or mother, not to follow directions but they have so much self-will that they disregard to be so opinionated that they don't listen to godly advice of others, right? Some of you young men have a lot of opinions. Well, they're like armpits. Everybody has a couple of them, okay? But let me just assure you of one thing. While I don't, while I don't disregard uh, what God has, has allowed you to do and, and the gifts that God has given you, what I do question is your wisdom. Because God says that the young man is supposed to learn discretion. That means you're to be taught it. That means you're to shut up and listen. If you find yourself as a young person talking more than you are listening, right, then you've got the order backwards. If you listen more than you talk and weigh your words wisely, right, it won't reveal how foolish your heart really is. <laughs> Because when we're youthful, when we're young, our hearts are very foolish. Mm -hmm. Foolishness is what? Bound. Bound in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction driveth it far from him. Amen. And I would say to you in, in, in the kindest way possible, but to, to, to help to produce some humility in you in this, is that you haven't done anything yet with your life. You haven't proved anything with your life yet. Right? You haven't proved anything with your life yet. You haven't suffered anything yet. You haven't stood on your own two feet yet. You haven't had to stand and, 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 and do those things that need to be done. So you ought to listen. You ought to learn. You ought to take the advice of others. And you ought to be quiet and not so quick to speak. Right? So you can learn. Right? That's how you keep from making mistakes. Amen. Right? You start getting opinionated and you start following your own opinions. Some of you, I, I, no doubt, I know some of you young men and young women, you, you think you got a lot figured out. And we thought that too. We thought we did too when we were your age. That's just, we, we, th we thought we, we had it all figured out, didn't we, Paul? We, I mean, we had, I mean, man, we had the dumb parents. What's wrong with them? What is wrong with them? My mom and dad don't know anything. 
I mean, they look, Dad. I, I, I know you're a little bit older and stuff, but look, I read a book, Dad. All right, and I'm pretty much sure I know what I'm talking about now. Right? I read some things, and I'm pretty sure that I know about life. I don't think, Dad. I don't think this decision is going to be a bad one uh, because I really want to do this. Ah, oh, that's good logic. Right? I think I'll be okay. I'll, I'll kind of just make decisions for myself, and that's self-will. That's self-will, and that leads to trouble. That leads to sin. It is sin. Because it's a disregard for the authority that God has given in your lives. It's, it is. We have to be careful. Children, guard your hearts against this rebellion. When you feel the urge to rebel against your parents, take it to Christ and beg him for a submissive heart, to godly authority and to leadership. Beg God to do that work. You say, but I don't want to. I want to go my own way. I know that's the problem. That's why you got to beg God to help you. You know, the longer you're saved, you know the one thing you realize you got saved from more than everything? Yourself. <laughs> say, man, I, I wanted to be saved from hell when I got saved. Me too. I just didn't realize how much hell was in me. I didn't realize how much hell was in me. Right? I'm learning that the longer I'm saved, how much... How much this flesh is bent on the fires of hell. Yeah. Right? right? Don't flirt with sin and rebellion and disobedience. Amen. Don't walk the line of the world and flirt with the world's standards of dress and walk and talk and the things that they do. Remember what the scriptures say as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. So as a pastor, a father, a leader, we're to be praying in the Spirit and asking God to reveal to us things in our children that we can help them with. To guard their hearts. And parents, we ought to guard their hearts as much as we can. Take nothing for granted. Warn them, protect them, guide them, and teach them. I think also wives and husbands would do well to deal with sin in each other. Amen. If we have impatience with each other or with our children and we don't handle things right, it is no sin for us to talk to each other and to be the check and balances of systems that we need to help each other out. Amen. It's not wrong for a wife to be alone with her husband and say, you know, and talk to him about things. Generally speaking, all she has to do is look at him after he's had an outburst like that and he's going to pretty much know what he's already done, right? Or the wife is already going to know that, right, what the husband's going to talk about or, you know, or what we need to talk about, right? That's that communication. There's nothing wrong with that. There, look, if you ever get this odd notion that the one flesh that God has given you, you know, should never you know, say anything to you if you're wrong or anything like that. You know what? She's the first person that should say something to you. Man, I'll tell you something right now. I would hate to be a wife or a husband and stand at the judgment seat of Christ knowing that I was wrong and I never did anything to help, right? The loss of reward that was there, right? We, th that's not a question. That's not questioning authority. Right? That's your wife. That's your one flesh. That's the, and, and if you're such a, if you feel yourself as such a man that that, 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 that that unmans you in some way, I don't see how. Right? I don't see how that would. How would it? Look, you know where I see, Brother Paul? I see it like this. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. If you tell me I'm wrong, Paul, or my wife tells me I'm wrong, if, if, it, if it's wrong, it's wrong. I mean, ain't no, I mean, God ain't no respecter of persons. Now, the way in which your wife does it is important. 
if she does it softly, oh man, she don't have to say very, I'm telling you, she don't have to say very much. If, if you love your wife and you, number one, if you love God and you love your wife, she don't have to say much at all. Right? You want to know the greatest thing that, that has always got to me, and I think God put this in me. Uh, I know he did because it wouldn't be in my flesh because <laughs> there's no good thing there. But the one thing that God gave me when he gave me my wife, he gave me this, this, this kind of utter fear of failing her or failing my children. And Annie gave me the same fear of failing this church because my greatest fear is to fail God. So then, therefore, anything that flows from that and my duty, I have a fear of failing Amen. in those things. And I don't mean that it, that, it cap, that, that it grips me so I can't do anything. I don't mean like a sinful fear. I mean a healthy reverence and an understanding that I don't want to be derelict in my duty. I, I, don't, I don't want to fail my wife. I don't want to fail my children. I don't want to fail the home. I don't want to fail this church. Because ultimately, it's to fail God. And I don't want to do that. So it, it, it brings me to tears when I, when I come to a place where I've realized that I've failed. Do you understand? It's not so much, she wouldn't have to say anything like yell at me or anything like, it wouldn't be, it's not like that. It's that I've disappointed God. I've disappointed her. I've disappointed the church or whatever it may be. That brings me to tears like that. And the reason it does is because that's love. That's the love of God. We don't want to disappoint God. It, you know, it's almost easier for people to be mad at you than it is for people to be disappointed in you. Because when they sit and talk to you like a father talks to a son, right? That's how you talk to them and you say, you know, I'm very disappointed in the way you've handled this, right? That, that speaks to the heart. You, people can handle anger and they can, they can bucket anger, but, when, but they don't bucket when, they're, when you're genuinely let down by, when you've let them down. When, the, when you tell them that, they're broken over that, right? There's something about that humility that God's put inside of us, right? Which is a good thing, right? It's a good thing. It's no sin for us to talk to each other and to be that checks and balances. There have been times I had to correct my wife for the way she's dealt with our children. There are times that I need her calming presence and cool head, right? At, at times when, when it comes to things that I cannot see at the time because sometimes... We get into it and we just can't see what's going on. And somebody's got to slow us down. Okay, slow down. Let's talk through this for a minute, right? And then it's like, oh, okay. By the way, does your wife have liberty to do that with you? It's a good question to ask, isn't it? Say, now you're prying. I know, like a pry bar. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Does your, does your wife have the liberty to do that with you? Or do you just talk down to her when she does it and try to shut her up? Right? Just shout her down or get her to shut up and get her to not talk because you're like the supreme ayatollah of authority, which, by the way, shows that you're not. When you've got to wear your badge of authority like that, you don't have any. Right? I'll give you a perfect example that David, when he was challenged by all these people, and they said, see what he did to the king? You ought to go kill him. And David said, don't I know that I'm king today? I don't need to do anything to him. Right? If you're secure in where God has put you and, what, and that you're right about it, then, then that challenge, you'll be able to withstand it. And if it's right, then you'll calmly take the scriptures and you'll show it. Right? But that's how you show it. You don't show it by some pretended manliness. 
some, some flexing in the mirror. You show it by the scriptures. If you're right, then it'll hold up to that book. If you're wrong, then you're going to have to repent. Right? Because the book's right no matter what. Yeah. Always. Right? This is a lot of practical stuff, isn't it? It's very practical. Amen? That's what we need, though, isn't it? Amen. Husbands, you've got to be open and let your wives speak to you. Better now than to allow the marriage to become a burning fire and to be stoned to death in Israel, right? Leaders have to deal with sin. I think of the church, that aspect, as a pastor, dealing with sin. You know, let me tell you something. I've not always dealt perfectly with it when it comes up. I can readily admit that to you. There are things that I would definitely do differently now, you know, that I did before that I would do differently now. Having understood some things, having God tempered some zeal, and having been humbled through many trials. That I, that I can tell you, I would handle things a little bit differently in some cases. But I can't go back and change those, can I? Neither can you. So, but I, but I can see, uh, but I've been guilty of what Joshua failed in, that he was listening to others, not getting his answers from God. That's a mistake. If a man whispers in your ear and you hearken unto him more than God, you'll be subverted in your cause. That'll happen to you. God forms the hearts of leaders. Therefore, the bulk of their direction comes from the book and from prayer and from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Joshua was still compassionate, though, in his dealing with Achan. If you look at it, he didn't lose his deportment because of sin and because of what happened, right? This comes from humility of being guilty or being wrong and being forgiven, right? Verse 19, And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. He was kind in his, rea in his question to him, right? <clears throat> and so should we be when we deal with the church and with others, with our children, with family members. We should be compassionate. We should be humble, even in our rebukes in that sense. One preacher called it the art of the rebuke. He said it was very important. We should always leave the channels of communication open to our children. If we've hollered and yelled and lost our cool with them, when they sin or make mistakes, they won't come to you as easily. If they commit something very damaging someday. Or after they've sinned or before they're going to do something. Right? We have to be wise and kind in our dealings with sin and those that are guilty. We don't wish for them to live in torture or for us to be unapproachable. We have to deal with sin, but how we deal with sin really does matter. Not just what we do. There are churches that have never dealt with sin before at all. They just let it grow in the church and it causes disaster. God instructs us on how to deal with it. Uh, I've heard of some of the Hiles churches that stated that they don't believe in church discipline at all. Like they don't believe in it. At all, period. They just, they don't, they don't believe it. Right? And they never, the people just don't show up. They don't come to church. Uh, if some scandal happens or something, they shift them somewhere else. Or they just never come back. And they never deal with the sin. They never deal with it. I, I know of a church that had something very bad happen with a, you know, an athletic director or something like that, and a young lady and all this, and, and which, by the way, was warned about like more than, on more than one occasion. Yeah, what's a church need with an athletic director? I know. I know what you're thinking. They have a Christian school, though, so, you know, you got to have that. Once you start having a Christian school, you know, you got to have, yeah, you got, you got to have athletes, and I, we don't have any athletic director. Although Lee could be the athletic director, he jumped from the floor to the pool into the pool, so he could be the athletic director. If we had one, it'd be Lee, probably. I don't know. I... Anyway, yeah. Anyway, so we don't have anything cool like that, no. We're not cool. We just have to be biblical. But, uh, but anyway, something, something took place, and they said, well, you know, the people wanted to talk about it, right? There was whispering among the people because this thing took place, and 
they said, well, we can't talk about it because of law, the lawsuits and all this other stuff. So they just dismissed him. Uh-uh. Oh, I'm telling you something right now. That dude, I'd be like, you know what? If you don't come back, I'm putting you on like Facebook Live. I don't care what I got to do. You're coming back in front of these people and you're going to you're going to look at these people and you're going to talk to them and you're going to admit what you did to them and how you sinned against God. And if you're not sorry for it, then we're kicking your sorry rear end out of this church. That's what we're doing. And you're going to formally be and we're going to put this on your name so everybody knows this is what you did until you have a desire to repent of this. Get right drag your sorry carcass back here and get it right with God. But you are not going to just skate out of town after you did that. Right? You're not going to just skate out of town. You can stand before them. You're going to stand on a computer screen. I don't care where you stand, but you're going to stand before these people. You ought to be right in front of them, though, right? But everybody ought to know that that guy did that. If he, if he doesn't want to get right, because why? Because he can't go to, you mark that man. He's not to go to another church. He's not to be a member anywhere else until he gets that right. Now that church might admit him, but we, but, but we would have the responsibility to send a letter to say, don't touch this guy, he's Ichabod. This is what he did. This is all the evidence against him. This is what he did. You know, if you did that, maybe that man would get right with God. Maybe he would be restored. No, I wouldn't make him an athletic director because I wouldn't have one of those anyway. But, um, but anyway, um, but, what I, but what he would do is, yeah, he could be restored, come back to church, be a faithful member, serve God, walk in humility. Sure. But they didn't do that, and they never do that. They just let them go, and they cover it up. And then everybody, w then, then there's no power in the church. The church is dead. It's like a stinking mortuary. It, there's no life in it at all. The preaching's dead in Adorno. How do you expect to have the power of God when you blaspheme his name by doing that? And let it go on. And it's Ichabod on the door and the whole place is just being done. And no one, I, how could you take that seriously? How could you take that pastor seriously? How could you take him seriously? You wouldn't. You're like, I don't want to listen to anything that guy says. So what happened? There's been like hundreds of members that left. Well, why wouldn't they leave? Why would you stay? Why would you stay and listen to a man that didn't have the guts enough to make that man come back and stand before that church? Amen. And if he wouldn't stand before that church, you could at least tell him that he wouldn't come back and this is what he did. Well, we can't because we're a 501c3 and there's legal aspects and all this other stuff. That's what they said. Well, brother, I remember a few years back when you told me you couldn't recommend our church because we weren't a 501c3. I'm just saying, your corporation didn't protect you there, did it? Right? Now, any one of us can fall into sin. Any one of us, I'm not, I'm not touting that we're better than anybody or anything. I already know what we're capable of. We're sinners saved by grace. We're capable of a lot of things. Yeah. I'm not, right, exactly. But if something does happen, it ought to be dealt with. Like, this is not some harbor for sin that people can just come and, and, and we can live any old way we want to and we can, like, fake it till we make it right. but that's what they do and they don't deal with sin and then the people they just leave or they just take off they never they never kept in touch they never wanted to transfer they never care the, they have the, these churches have like hundreds of people on their books that they, they never they never show up right hey I've been I've seen men that were authors that wrote books that Talked about all, do the same thing. Couldn't believe it. Was dumbfounded by it. Didn't even say goodbye. Wouldn't even talk to you. Wouldn't even have any correspondence with you. Churches today have no accountability. People float in and they float out. They just leave. But dealing with sin and conducting discipline is part of the duty of the local church. We have in this church practiced discipline on those that decided to leave with no trace and accountability. And though they never followed through, we did. We followed through. Though they had no care to comply with the direction nor give an answer, we still did. Because God still holds us accountable to deal with sin in the camp. Achan disregarded the Lord's commands, but Joshua still did that which was right. We see churches today that they'll just let it go. They don't care. You know, let me, let, let me explain something to you. 
A pastor is a shepherd, and he is commanded by God to feed the flock and to what? Watch for their souls. And people that just want to leave with no accountability and just take off and do what they want, you're asking me to disobey God and not watch for your soul. Like I don't have to give an account, right? right? Like I don't have to stand before God and say, well, God, I just let them go because they made things hard for me. Right? They just take off and leave. Or I had one young man, he, he made it so, I, I tried to help him for a, over a year. And he, he wouldn't come to church. He wouldn't, he wouldn't do anything. Finally, I just had to, we, we had to, as a church, come together. We had to just vote him out. I mean, we couldn't do anything about it. We waited a year. I waited a year. I mean, I even met with the guy privately, and he would show up 45 minutes late to a meeting with me. I'm not kidding you. Yeah. And he wouldn't even, I asked him to read one verse of scripture, and he wouldn't read one. And he told me that, like, no, I'm not going to read anything. He literally, he just wanted me to take it to the church and be out. He wouldn't be man enough to do it himself. He's that much of a coward. And then he went off and badmouthed me and told everybody that we weren't nice to him. Right. You know, if you don't want to do right, then we have a duty. If we don't want to do, any of us don't want to do right, then we have a duty to correct and plead with you. If you will not, then we have a duty to formally separate from you from our company. That's, that's what the Bible says. That's, that's the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 shows us that. By the way, I've had people not want to be baptized because of that accountability. Like, they didn't want to be a part of anybody. They didn't, they didn't want anybody to care. They didn't want anybody to care about them, basically. What you're telling me when you say that to me, when you say you just want to float in, float out, do whatever you want, to, you're telling me, I don't want a pastor to care for me. Right. I don't want one to watch over me. Like, I don't even believe the Bible about that stuff. Right? All that stuff in the Bible about accountability and all... I don't believe that stuff. You just sound like a cult. That's what it is. You must be a cult, right? Really? Yeah, because anytime somebody wants to observe a watch care over their members, they must be, they must be a cult leader. Right? They, they must be. That they care for their soul. They must be. Right? So, Pastor, you should just care for the money and not their soul. Let them come in, give some money, let them do what they want to do. And if they want to come, they can come. If it's like a country club, they can come in, play golf, play nine rounds at church, and, and, then, and, then, and then go home, right? Yeah. Right? Sorry, Marv, I know you're a golfer. But... <laughs> right? But, the, the, right? But yeah, he really gets the story. Yeah, you really understand, don't you? Yeah. But, uh, but that's what they want. And then don't, don't care for my soul. Don't watch over me. Don't hold me accountable. Right? But then guess what they look for? Weddings and funerals. Yeah. They look for a pastor at church. Yeah. Right? That's what they do, right? Weddings and funerals. Other than that, that's the way it is, isn't it? Let me ask you a question. If I just didn't show up on Sunday, what would happen? <laughs> Rest assured, you'd want to hold me accountable, wouldn't you, if I just didn't show up? You're like, what's going on? What do you mean you just don't show up? Well, I don't know. I was kind of tired. <laughs> Long day. Long week. Long wife. Kind of busy. Right? What's the matter with you? You'd be like, what kind, of, what kind of dedication is that? Well, touche. I'll ask you the same thing. Right? Stuff is hard. Right? But, they, but when you don't want accountability, you're like, eh. See, you have to understand something. This is my father's business. Wish you not that I must be about my father's business? That's what Jesus said. I mean, I take the crown... The shepherd's crown seriously, right? 
There's a crown. Right? I really believe that. I do. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Right? So then there's... The Bible says, Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy herds. To duty. 1 Corinthians 5 deals with that discipline as well. That loosing and binding powers. Wow, this thing is long. It is long. I, I, I'm not done yet either, really. I'm not. You know, there's another aspect. Some of you may not be in any sin at all, but maybe you have some problems and some struggles that you're going through. It's kept you from getting the help you need. You're afraid to get help. You're afraid to talk about it. Or shame has kept you from asking for help. You know, your marriage might be struggling and you don't want to ask for help. But it's easy to see that there's some problem, right, that, that's not being worked out, or some coldness or detachment or something. Or maybe it's something else. It doesn't be your marriage. It can be anything. You, you need not be afraid to get help, get some advice. Sometimes you and I need that. God gave you a pastor for a reason. He really did. Like, he really did give you a pastor for, like, it, like he wasn't joking when he said, okay, <laughs> yeah, and he, as pastor's a gift and watches for your soul as they that must give it a, like, that wasn't, like, he wasn't kidding about that. He was really serious. Right? The Bible warns us, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. I think one of the main principles we take from this chapter in Joshua 7 is that leaders have to deal with that sin. I thank God I'm not a priest and you don't need to confess your secret sins or your secret faults to me. And I certainly do not want that. I have enough rolling around in my own head. I don't need any of yours. All right? I got to fight those, all right? <laughs> sin doesn't have dominion over you, right? Burdens are lifted at Calvary. What's the Bible tell us? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My goal is to point you to Christ, to get the forgiveness from Christ, to confess your... I don't want you... I'm not the priest. Believe me, I don't. I've heard a lot of crazy things, and quite frankly, I hate hearing them, but sometimes I have to hear crazy things. That's the way life is, but, uh, especially my ministry. But, but we ask. We go to the Lord. But I want to remind you of something as a Christian. The Bible says there is a sin unto death. Number five, there is a sin unto death. 1 John 5, 16 says, If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. And the Bible goes on to say all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. So he's explaining that, you know, we do sin, we're to confess our sin. We're to get it right, right? All unrighteousness is sin, but there is a sin unto death. I don't know what that is. And quite frankly, I'm glad I do not know what that is. Because you'd be tempted every day of your life to commit it if you knew what that sin was, right? All Adam was told was, don't eat that tree. Don't eat that tree. First thing that happened, right? Right? So God doesn't tell us that what that sin is for each person. Exactly, so the devil doesn't know what to tempt you with. That's right. That is a good point. That's right. So he doesn't know what to tempt you with, right? So um, I don't know what that is for everybody. I, I have my thoughts about what it is for me just because of what God has drilled into my heart, you know, but... Whatever it is, it doesn't really matter, but there is a sin like that. Stay away from all sin, right? Sin kills. In the Christian, it will kill. Christians cannot sin and it have no effect on them. It will affect them. God is placing his divine law and the law of Christ as sin unto death. One man preached a message. Anybody remember that? God's three deadlines? Yeah. J. Harold Smith, I think it is. is that it? That's a good sermon, man. God's three deadlines. Who's heard that sermon? Anybody here? Man, go on YouTube and listen to that sermon. God's three deadlines. Also, the God of the Bible. Yeah, the God of the Bible. Is that Rolf Barner? 
Yeah, the God of the Bible kills people. Yeah, that's a good one, too. Since we're talking about pleasant things. <laughs> it's a good one. Probably not one you listen to at midnight. No. Probably just save that during the day when... Right? I don't know what that sin is for you, but brethren, we ought to pray for one another. Pray for us. Pray for each other that we never commit such heinous acts, that God keeps our mind and our hearts, that we stay far away from evil. We pray the Holy Spirit would make us sensitive to sin, that we do not get close to it. And when we are tempted, we ask others for prayer. Watch and pray, the Bible says, that you enter not into temptation. There's nothing wrong with you sending a message to somebody asking for prayer when you're going through some temptation. You know what? When you're going through something, some severe temptation, you feel like you're being cornered by the devil. There ain't nothing wrong with you calling somebody. But you know what? I wonder if some of you just don't call on the Lord when you're going through that at all. Don't use somebody else as an idol either. You ought to call upon the name of the Lord and cry out to God. You know what it means to cry out to God? You ought to cry out to God. Amen. Don't use man as an idol either. But if you need prayer from somebody else, that's a good idea. It's a good, it's a good admonition and direction from God. We have to pray not to be taken by sin. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Some of you have said to me and have shared the same concerns that I've had, afraid of falling into sin. Well, that's the Holy Ghost humbling you and making you sensitive to it. So then pray. Pray against it. Cry out to God against it. And he'll intercede for you. He won't suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. But with the temptation, we'll make a way to escape. That's what you need is a way to escape, right? And the Holy Ghost gives that way. God is your way of escape. Christ. He's our scapegoat. Amen. You ought to use all the examples of men falling in your life to pray against it. Just this week, I have a friend that ordained, not this week, he didn't ordain him, but years ago, he ordained a man. They, his church did, and they sent him over to uh, overseas. And that man came back, said that... Uh, you know, he got carried away with the dissimulation, a church split and some other things and got into this universal church doctrine thing where we're all the church and waving your hands like some weird moonies or something. And then and then uh, they got he got into that stuff. And then basically he contacts all the all the brothers in Christ. And he says, I'm no longer a Christian anymore. If you talk to me about be me about God, talk to me about God again. We're going to get into a fight. So warn every single one of them, let them know that if, if you come near me and you start talking to me, because I know how you guys try to convince people on the streets, and I've been with you, and they do, he goes, if you do that, if you talk to us, then, then, uh, then we're going to be fighting. That's what he said to them. Right. Yeah, well, that's why we got to pray. Right? That's why we got, every time I hear that, I just pray. Right? By the way, he was carried about with an insurrection in the church that happened. Uh, a real one, not one like the fake one that was at the Capitol, but a real one. Uh, not a bunch of Trump guys with fanny packs on, but a real insurrection that took place. Um, with uh, <laughs> that fake insurrection that happened. Yeah, that's not real. Whatever. <laughs> But this church, they caused, it, they caused a big uproar in the church. They caused a church split. Many people fell, and the fallout of that. See, something always happens. There's always a fallout with things like that that take place. We had, that, we had things happen here. There's always a fallout. People get hurt, right? People get hurt. People that are weaker, sometimes they never come back, you know, to the Lord. I don't mean to this church. I mean to the Lord. They just they fall away. Take heed, my brethren, lest you fall. And you that are here that are not saved, you that have never come to Christ and repented and asked him to save your soul, I would ask you the same thing Joshua asked Achan, my son or daughter, give, I pray thee, glory to the God of Israel and make confession unto him. 
You know, Achan was burned in the fire. One day you'll be burned in the fire if you're not saved. One day you will fall headlong into hell, never to return. The most scariest thing about hell is that there are no exits. There's no way out. There, there's no way out. You stand before God at the, at the white throne judgment, and then you're cast in the lake of fire for all of eternity. That's where you go. That's the, that's the end, only it never ends. It's everlasting. Just like there's everlasting life, there's everlasting punishment. There's everlasting torment. Both of those things are true. But there is absolutely no reason besides sin and pride that anyone in this room should ever go there. Amen. You have all the opportunity that anyone could ever have to turn to Christ and believe the gospel and be saved. To be gloriously saved and changed by his power, by his spirit, to have him put a new heart in you, to make you a new creature where old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. There must be a time when you turn to Christ. There must be a time when you trusted him as your Lord and Savior. There must be a time that you turned to him and said, Lord, I believe. There must be a time that you believed on the Son and hath eternal life. But the Bible says, He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. But Jesus paid for your wrath. He suffered your hell so you could have heaven. He went, through, he went through the torture of the cross. He went through the agonizing pain of shedding his blood on the cross for your soul. He went through and paid the penalty for sin. And all you must do is look and live. I like that Spurgeon's uh, testimony, his salvation testimony was look and live. Amen. That preacher that was a substitute preacher that came in on a cold night, right? He came in on a cold night and all he did was say like the same words over and over again. And he pointed at Spurge and he said, you, you there, you there, look and live. Amen. And that's all he needed. Because he was in turmoil for years over his soul. And all he needed was to look and live. And that's all you need today if you're a lost, hell-bound sinner, guilty before God, dead in trespasses and sins, on your way to hell, you must own your sinful condition before God, confess it before God, and say, Lord, I'm a lost, hell-bound sinner, and I know I deserve it. But Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Amen? That's the gospel we preach, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the only one that saves. That's the same gospel that brought me before you today from being a drug addict, from being a, a fornicator, from a life of hell to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel that saved my soul. And it's the same one that I preach to you today. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you one thing. It'll be a sorry state for you. It'll be a sorry place for you to be under all this preaching and to identify with Lucifer in the lake of fire because of your pride. Right? That's the sin of Sodom, right? Pride. Pride. They died because of pride. Yeah, and what did that pride lead to? Every other sin. I don't disagree with that. It led to every other sin. Pride always leads to every other sin, right? We exalt ourselves. Satan exalted himself above God. Sin. With sin in our flesh, we exalt ourselves above God. We say, God, we're going to go our own way. Choose you this day whom you will serve. If the Lord be God, then follow him. Right? If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Amen. That's the greatest news I could ever give you, is that Jesus saves, and he is ever merciful to sinners. And I do not regret one moment of serving him. I only regret the mistakes I've made. But I have no regret in what he's done for me. He took a life that was in shambles and made it worth living. 
and made it useful to him. And he'll do the same for you. Amen. Glory to his name. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus saves. Remember that. Remember that. Own your guilt before God and then trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. Turn. Turn. For why will you die in your sins? What a question. Why would you die in your sins? You don't have to. Right? I like that song. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves, right? Amen. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for eternal life. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this message and this book and this church. Thank you for the power of the Spirit of God. Lord, help us to deal with sin in our hearts, our own hearts, Lord. Look in the mirror first. Help us to do that, Lord. And help us then to look to the state of our flocks, look to the people that we have underneath us, our family, our wives, our children, those that we instruct, and help them with their sin. Show them. And, oh, God, if there be a lost sinner here, which I know there probably is, a few, God, please, have them take their sin to the cross and be healed today. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.